Okay, it's logging in. Hello. Can y'all hear me? <laughs> so much excitement in the chat. Hello. <laughs> Hi guys. All right. My name is Georgie. If you don't know who I am, I'm from Procreate. You probably have seen me on the Instagram. Thank you so much for joining us here today. We are streaming with Loish all the way from the Netherlands. If you're from America in the chat, what are you doing? Go to sleep, honestly. <laughs> This live stream will be recorded and you can watch it later if it is going to go too long for you. Um, if you have any questions during the stream, please feel free to ask in the comments. The lovely LOL from Procreate is in the comments to talk with you guys as well. And I do apologize ahead of time if you hear the tippy taps of small feet because my dogs have decided it's time to play a game. So <laughs> without further ado, I will hand over to Loish. Hey. Yeah, hey everybody. Oh, it's so weird sitting here and seeing all these chats come in and <laughs> um <laughs> and like seeing the people in the US who stayed up late to join. So cool to see. Um I'm kind of nervous today cuz I just really haven't thought of like what I'm going to draw yet. So like I'm totally blank. Um <laughs> But I always do that on purpose uh, for these kind of live streams and demonstrations so that because I what the message that I want to give people when I draw, um, when I do a live demonstration is that like you can just go with the flow because um, I think it's really important not to overthink too much and to just kind of, you know, wing it and see where your drawing takes you, um, which, you know, is is sometimes a little hard because now I just I just have like zero starting point, but I'm just going to start sketching uh, right now and just kind of watching the messages come in. Um, also, what would be really fun is if you guys all because I can see some people are already saying like hello from Ukraine and hello from America. Yeah, like let me know where you're at right now. Let's see like in the chat or where they're located. Oh, so you guys are like people. everywhere. It's really my cool. goodness. Oh. Hey, Loish, before we get too far into it, yeah, um, I've just noticed that our Procreate UI is a little bit off the stream there. So could I just oh. get you to ad adjust it a bit so that people can see what's happening with the layers and stuff when that opens? Yes. Uh, one second. I can definitely fix that. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. Oh my goodness, literally people from everywhere. Hello. Oh, this is so fun. I love this. Whoa. This is wholesome. Yay. India, Germany, Italy. I feel like um, the time zones that are normally kind of like that, you know, um, when there's online events, they're mostly made for like the American time zone. Mm. And then there's like that whole time zone where you're located, Georgie, that usually falls outside of that or is like an inconvenient time. <laughs> and now they're all oh, here. Man. <laughs> oh, the Australian time zone and surrounding, I guess like the Australasia time zones in general get yeah. hit so badly when we do like online events and stuff. Just no one can join in. It's so disappointing. Yeah. But it's you're always like middle now. of the night. Yeah. It's so <laughs> cool to see. Oh, I love it. I love it. Okay, great. Thank you guys so much for joining. This is fun. Um, okay, so everything should be... Georgie, could you let me know uh, whether it all fits in now? Yeah, color, color wheel looks good. Just the other end now with the gallery. It's just a little bit in. Sorry, guys, I'm being so picky here. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, it should be fixed. It should be fixed. Let's see. Probably a little bit of a delay on the stream. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that it's definitely fixed now. Yeah, cool. All right, let's dive into it. Okay, cool. All right, so I'm going to start sketching. I'm like, again, very nervous, but I have to do this, you know, I signed up for this, so I, there's no coming back now. <laughs> <laughs> Literally, whenever I do an online, <laughs> whenever I do an online <laughs> event or a live demonstration at an event, I'm like, my whole emotion about that beforehand is why did I ever say yes? Um, but <laughs> I never regret it afterwards. So I just, I just keep saying yes. Um, okay, so I have like, people ask me a lot about my Procreate brushes. So I'll talk about that a little bit. Um, when I first got Procreate, 
the very first brush set that I downloaded was called Rasm Ink Pro 2. And that's like a brush set that I just found. I just literally went to Cube Brush and I said, I typed in Procreate Brushes. And then I um, just downloaded the first brush set that looked pretty cool to me. And so I still use a lot of brushes from this set. And what I like about Rasm Ink Pro 2 is that it has like all of these concept arty kind of brushes. So they're like, mm -hmm. there's some messy, like everything's got a bit of a texture and everything is sort of, I don't know, it just kind of inspires me to experiment and try different stuff out with them. So that's like the, my, my main brush set that I've been using since the very start. And um, my favorite brush from that is the Rasm Ink Pro 2 Shade. Although in the new updates, it looks a little bit different. Um, but like this brush has like one hard edge and one soft edge sort of. And because of that, it's like got like nice sweepy lines, kind of, I don't know, graphite effect almost. Mm. And whenever I post a process video with this brush, people are like, what is that brush? And what, where do you get your brushes? So I really have to give a big shout out to the Rasm Ink Pro 2 set for this, this brush. It's, it's really nice. I, I love sketching with it. So, all right, time to get started on a drawing. Um, and I'm just going to make something up off the top of my head. It's going to be a character because that's, um, like what I usually draw during demos. And I usually yeah. use a construction technique that I got from a, like I've mentioned this a lot, but I got it from a, like searching in 2003 on the internet for a how to draw anime head tutorial. And oh, that's cool. still the technique that I use. <laughs> So these online, hey, when you find something that works, right? Yeah, these online to, like resources that you can find for free that artists share with each other can have like such mm -hmm. a huge impact. Um, and that one Absolutely. always stuck with me. Yeah, and because of that, I learned how to use like simple shapes. And yeah, I just love putting down random lines and just seeing like what is you know what happens. What what do I feel when I look at it? Mm. Um, just so that I, you know, because I, you know, artists put like a lot, like high expectations on themselves, you know, a lot of the time. Like they're like, oh, I'm going to make the, you know, I, a lot of artists, I've, I've done this too. They go on um, uh, Pinterest and look up like the most beautiful art they've ever seen. And they're like, this is my inspiration. And they want to make something stunning and gorgeous, which obviously like everybody wants to do. But then you, you generate expectations for your drawing that might be like a bit extreme and you'll get like disappointed as you draw, you know? So that's why I like to just put down some lines with zero ideas of what I'm going to do and just wing it. Just kind of see what happens. Yeah. So is that usually how you do all of your pieces or are there some that you're, um, you go into definitely knowing what you're doing? Sometimes like I, I have like certain ideas. Sometimes I'm like, okay, I know that I want to do a drawing with, I don't know, a lot of plants in it or a drawing with a certain kind of mood or story. And then I will do more research and come up with a clearer idea of what I want it to be before starting. Mm. But then I'll still, if the drawing is turning out different from what I expect, I'll still kind of like um, uh, just go with that. You know, like just not get too stuck, like not worry too much if it's turning out different. Yeah. Um, so it's like a kind of mix of like managing my expectation and kind of seeing like what is appearing in front of me, um, which keeps me from like getting stuck, you know? Yeah, for sure. And you use the same with color palettes. Do you just kind of go with whatever the piece is feeling there too? Um, yeah, definitely. I'm going to show it later, yeah. but like uh, the reason that I love digital art, that digital art is really my thing is because, um, you know, you can kind of change the colors as you go. So you can put something down and then adjust it, you know? And it's like, it gives you the freedom to just constantly play around with what you've got in front of you. And that's like the yeah. complete opposite really of um, like traditional painting where, you know, you do have to think about that stuff. You have to have your colors ready in advance and you need to work it out a lot better. 
And digital art is like, you can just completely, I've, I've had digital paintings that I like completely changed the whole entire painting halfway through. Like <laughs> literally just changed the what? color scheme from like, you know, I was going for like green and yellow and then I just changed the whole thing to purple and the whole mood changes. And like, I go from like organic shapes to straight ones, like just halfway through, which is just mm. amazing about digital art, you know? It sounds so exciting and chaotic as well. <laughs> Yeah, it is. Well, sometimes the mood just changes or something. I think any digital artist would relate. I think any artist would relate to like you're, you're drawing and you're really into like a kind of, um, you know, direction for your drawing. And then you get back to it later and you're like, I'm in a completely different mood. And mm -hmm. then you just change the whole drawing. I, I love that. I think it's just so yeah. freeing about digital art. Absolutely. And are you formally taught at all or did you teach everything yourself like with your online anime head tutorials and stuff <laughs> uh yeah I, I I so what was really foundational for me uh was like getting art lessons as a kid uh when I was like around eight years old my uh we lived in the U.S. and my mom signed me up to like all of these um like art classes and stuff and I had like extracurricular art courses from a teacher who taught me how to draw from observation. So she would give us all like a draw, like a photo, and she would be like, copy this photo. And then we would do that. And then she would come around and like correct stuff, be like, no, this this flower is here. And from that process, I, compl I learned to observe and to kind of correct my observations as well, like to check and so I learned how to draw from observation from her and that was like a, a really important to me. And then I kind of like used that technique to learn how to teach myself how to draw basically from that point forward. So I would just like, I'd be like, all right, my skills are kind of like stuck. So I'm just gonna copy stuff. You know, I'm gonna like, I wanna learn how to draw animals. Okay, I'm gonna like get photos of animals and just draw those. Or like mm. I learned how to draw faces from like referencing my own face and and then I got to a point where I wanted to learn digital art and that, and that I'm completely self-taught. I just, uh, just messed around. Like my whole workflow is just from messing around in, in these digital programs and seeing what happens. So like, that's why I was saying earlier when we were talking earlier, how I did a procreate tutorial and like in the tutorial, I'm like, I don't know what this is or how this works, but <laughs> whatever I, I use it, you know? And I got a lot of like comments on my Patreon of people being like, well, Lois, you can just turn that off with this one button. And I'm like, oh, thank you. Like I, I'm terrible at researching how something works. I just wing it. I just jump in and I just kind of see what happens. And that's how I taught myself how to draw digitally. <laughs> that's um, the most fun sometimes though. Like I, I really enjoy that process. I think where you just kind of try everything and see what sticks. You can find so many fun things in doing that. Oh, for sure. And also you find out what you need to know. Cause like, I am just really bad at taking in like a lot of excess information. Like I just mm -hmm. shut down when I get a lot of information coming at me. Um, I don't know why that is. I just like, I, I love learning new things, but I need to be in the mindset. And if somebody comes at me and they're like, Hey, did you know that like, you can do this and this and this, and this software can do that. And if you press this button, you get this and and my brain just gets saturated. You know, I just think like, I just don't follow it anymore. Um, yeah. So that's why I like to just jump in and kind of see what's possible because then I kind of filter the information based on what I'm trying to achieve. And I don't get distracted by the possibilities because like for me, having a, an absurd amount of possibilities is is actually a paralyzing thing. It doesn't make me feel free or excited to try stuff it makes me feel like overwhelmed and not knowing what to do so that's yeah. that's always been my way of doing it and it's funny because like my boyfriend is the complete opposite he's like he likes to know all, what all the possibilities are and that inspires him and and so he comes at me and he's like hey you could try using this and this workflow and technique and there's a new option and I'm like I have no idea what you're talking about <laughs> stop and then I just stick to my own completely inefficient methods <laughs> <laughs> if it ain't broke don't fix it so yeah. is he a an artist as well yes 
he i i Lovely. we met at animation school and he's a 3d animator and i am a 2d oh, animator wow. so that's like already showing kind of a difference in mindset right because he like knows how to use the 3d software yeah Oh, that's really interesting. I had no idea that you dabbled into the animation or that you, I mean, that you were, that you were at animation school. Yeah, I, uh, I studied 2D animation for five years, uh, one, one year in Belgium and four years in the Netherlands. And oh. I thought I was going to become a, a proper animator, but uh, I ended up going into concept art. I ended up getting more like approached for my, um, my art rather than my animation work. So. Yeah. yeah, that's how it all went. Do you me. still dabble in animation? Um, I do concept art for animation productions, but yeah, I don't okay. animate anymore. Um, no, sadly, I found out that that's like, it's a really tough industry here in the Netherlands because mm. we don't really have big animation studios. Um, by the way, the brush I'm using now for this like second sketch. So I've got like my first sketch, which is really rough and simple. And like, I think it's really important to keep the first sketch as loose as you can as you can because that'll give you like life and movement and stuff um and and also like keep you from getting stuck on details right because I think that any artist can relate to like you're sketching and then you get stuck on a detail and then you completely lose the momentum of your sketch so I try to keep it really loose and then on a separate layer on top I'm gonna like work out the details a bit more and on my loose layer, I've been using that Rasm, uh, Rasm Ink Pro shader brush. And now I'm using uh, a brush by uh, Max Ulichny. So he's got the Max Packs brushes and it's from his gouache set. And this is like called gouache clean. Um, I've got his like, he, he allowed me to test the brushes in advance. So in my, in my setup, it's called Max U gouache B, which is like not the name in the final set. In the final set, it's gouache <laughs> clean. Um, and I, he sent me the new one already, but like, I just have been too lazy to install it. So now I'm showing, <laughs> showing how lazy I am with keeping up with my brushes right here in a Procreate stream. Um, Are they, uh, his new top secret ones that should be coming quite soon? No, they're already out. It's the, it's the gouache oh. set. Yeah. They're wonderful. Wow. Wonderful. Especially I'm for so painters. Sorry, Max, if he's, uh. If he's watching or if he's going to be watching that I may have I hope given not. something away there. I don't think I have. I think he's been teasing it. But um yeah, I'm yeah, always he's so got a new, for a new set. Yeah. yeah, his brushes are incredible. I think that like I think it's so cool to see somebody with cuz he's also I believe from the animation sphere. Like he's worked in on animation productions, I believe. Yeah. You could you could tell in his art that he's got that that animation style and a stylized way of using using brushes and sketching and and that makes his mm. brushes like great i think um so yeah winter room wait hold on who's drawing lois she's drawing <laughs> <laughs> some people in the comments it's so funny to hear though just before lois you were saying that um uh you know like your loose sketch and stuff and people in the comments were going wow the sketching is so clean uh. <laughs> A little bit of contrast there. Yeah, that's that's Hinata. a thing. Like, yeah. Sorry, I've just got a, a question in here from Hanada. She wants to know um, what were the names of the art schools that you went to. Um, okay, so I went to. Um, <laughs> this is gonna turn into an art school rant. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <no>. um, <laughs> um, I went to a uh, the. It's called Gosk in, in Ghent, in Belgium. I just used a, a, a Dutch kind of sound, Ghent, <laughs> which uh, tends to terrify people who don't speak Dutch. Um, but yeah, it's, it's like a school in, it's like the art school in, in Ghent. And there, it's called the Koninklijke Academie voor de Schone Kunsten. And uh, I, I was there for a year, but it was like not a good fit for me at all. Um, mm. Because they were like, uh, they were more, how do I say this without being mean? Um, very artistic. Like they didn't like commercial art. Let me put it that way. Um, mm. they were really That's geared towards, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they didn't like digital for sure. Um, it was also very unfortunate timing. Uh, I think this is something that like maybe the younger generation, uh, 
maybe doesn't know about as as much as I experienced this. <laughs> but like when I mm. went to art school, we were like between two eras. Um, like before I went, I studied animation. There was an animation industry where, you know, you drew in like four by three and you drew like animation on paper and you learned how to like record DV tape so you could like deliver it on a DV tape to the animation studio. And like, it was very old fashioned. Um, social media didn't exist and digital art was like, hadn't like digital techniques were being used by big studios, but they weren't being used like on a, on a large scale in Belgium at that time. And uh, my teachers were of the older generation and they didn't like digital. They didn't trust it at all. So if I did too much digital art, they would be like, all right, you're depending too much on digital media. You need to like jump into like your paints or whatever. And that was like immensely frustrating to me because as a younger person, I could, I just knew that like this was not going to last. You know, I just knew that like there was no way that like that would be asked of me in the industry. Um, mm. And then I, so, and and in the second school that I went to, which was the Utrecht School of the Arts, the HKU in Dutch, um, it was similar. Like they were kind of stuck between two different um they were kind of stuck between uh, two different like eras and it was really hard to get, like they didn't know like comic cons weren't a thing yet. Like fan art and anime influence styles were really looked down upon and they would say mm -hmm. like that you couldn't make a living off of it, but that it like wasn't true. But I think they just didn't trust that style and they didn't trust like the digital art that we know today. That's like quite popular and that you see everywhere. Um, so those schools, like my experience in them was kind of like a lot of frustration because I felt like what I wanted to do, they didn't understand. So I really had to keep my kind of like style and, and the stuff that I, I love to do kind of away from my teachers. Yeah. So it's so, a stylized, um, the stylized art that you do now that was developed later on in your career then you kind of had to keep that hidden from early on from teachers and stuff like that um the stuff that I do the stylized stuff that I do now I've actually been kind of working in a similar style to this to some extent since like 2003 but my teachers were yeah, like okay. we don't want to see that stuff they were like just put it away <laughs> hmm. so um so it was like my own thing it was something that I did only for myself uh for yeah. a long time and it was my guilty pleasure that's what I always call it and that's why I tell other people like to keep to hold on to your guilty pleasure because first of all like it keeps you it allows you to have fun drawing but second of all for me I managed to make a living off of it and I didn't know that at the time so when I went to school I was told that I would not be able to make a living off wow. of uh off of this kind of stuff and now I do make a living off of it so it's it's been a, like a long road <laughs> Of, yeah, absolutely. Of figuring out what works for me and what what kind of career I can I I can make with my skills. And now I've I figured out that I, you know, that it is possible for me. But for a long time, my teachers were were not helpful <laughs> in supporting it. Yeah, I think everyone has a bad art teacher story like that. It's, yeah, um, for sure. And I I think yeah. a lot of art teachers are not really up to date with what's going on. Yeah. Because in my case, like they just were pointing the. Yeah, it's also like they are experts in the field that they kind of learned how to understand many mm. years ago. Like the, my teachers were all kind of living in a different time, which is okay. Like they have expertise from their uh, experience, but it just, times are changing too fast, you know? Like yeah. even now, like any advice that I can give is also based on my experience from like 10 or 15 years ago. Like everything's changing so fast. And that's why I always say like, just go with the flow. Like don't get stuck too much on one idea in your art, but also in life, you know what I mean? Cause like technology and styles and trends and platforms and they're all changing constantly so fast that you can't yeah. even keep up. All right, I think I'm gonna go for color now. All right, so this is Ooh. something that I always wanna tell people about, like, cause in my digital art technique, I don't throw out my 
my sketch, like my, my rough sketch lines. I try to keep them. Um, I don't like, I think in the past I would have like tossed out, you know, those rough sketch lines that I did in the beginning. But when I click them away, I feel like they're just, um, you know, like so much movement is lost. Um, so I, I try to like keep them and just have them a bit lighter. So I have the opacity like around 60 and, and I just, this is going to be my, my lines. These are going to be the lines that I start adding color from. And I don't really do like neat line work anymore. Um, because I just, I, I think I'm just lazy and I just never felt like doing it. So, and, and then, and then I didn't, when I like went straight from sketch to color, it wasn't really a big problem. Uh, I found out like nobody really called me out on it and it wasn't an issue. So I just, it made things a lot easier. So I'm going to um, combine them in a group and then duplicate the group because I'm like scared to throw it away, <laughs> uh, the separated layers. So now I have like a group where there's two separated layers, rough and, and defined sketch. And then on top, they're merged together. And I'm going to add some color, like block in a silhouette underneath those, those rough lines. And I'm just going to pick a completely random color and make sure that my lines are set to multiply and just start blocking in the silhouette. I always love seeing the color go down. I think for me, it's the most exciting part because I'm just so obsessed with color. Oh yeah, same. I'm just, that's, I think that's why I go from rough sketch to color because I like just can't wait. I'm like, all right, let's, <laughs> let's do it. Let's get into it. <laughs> Why you get started on that, we've got a few questions from the audience. So Rashid wants to know if you offer any online classes or mentorships. Now I have seen some people in the comments letting him know that you have a Patreon, which is also linked in the caption for this video, guys, if you want to go and support Loesch there and find her tutorials. But do you offer any other classes or mentorships, Loesch? Um, I don't do mentorships, unfortunately, because I just don't have the time. Um, and I, I set up the Patreon to try and like kind of cover as, as many bases as I can with, um, you know, sharing knowledge. So any you, people can sign up for $5 a month and then you get like mm. everything that I've ever posted on there. And there's now nine tutorials and every month there's a new one. And there's also like step-by-steps process videos and all that. Um, so, I, and I try to like answer as many questions as I can there. So that's sort of like my, like as close as it, as it gets to a mentorship, uh, so to speak. So, but I, I, I try to focus, um, sharing learning materials, like to a larger group rather than, um, specific people purely because of time, purely because that, that helps mm -hmm. me, uh, share knowledge in a way that doesn't take too much time. And then I can fit that all in. Um, yeah. So yeah, and there's two Procreate tutorials as well, like extensive Procreate tutorials. All of the tutorials are about like 40 minutes long or even an hour long. Oh, wow. Yeah, I, I tried to make mini tutorials. So I posted, I was like, I'm going to make mini tutorials. And then I posted like a 50 minute video. And everyone was like, this is not a mini tutorial, Lois. And then I realized like I'm literally not capable of like talking about a subject for less than 40 minutes if I really want to. Like <laughs> if somebody asks me like, okay, how does color work? I'll be like, all right, let's start with the history of color. The very first color that existed. <laughs> like I want to go into the topic as much as I can. So it ends up being really long, but I've accepted that. Like it takes, it's more work for me to shorten it than it is for me to mm. just let the information flow. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I'd watch that. That sounds really interesting. The history of color would be excellent. Yeah. I feel like, you know, you have to like start with the basics. Um, but anyway, so now at this point, right, I've put down a random color and I've kind of blocked in a silhouette and I'm going to like use my hue saturation slider to kind of like choose the color. And I don't really know, like, I don't really know what it's going to be yet, but I'm going to just go along the slider and just kind of see like, what do I feel when I see, you know, each color. Uh, and that's, I think color is like an emotional thing. Like you see it and it, it, it makes you feel a certain way. And that's why I love these sliders because then you can just kind of see like, all right, which one, which one fits my mood, which one fits like what I'm trying to achieve right now. 
Um, and, and I can use like kind of my intuition, you know, to find it. And because it's, it's almost spring, I'm going to go for like some fresh colors, something like this. And I'm going to uh, lock the alpha. And then I'm going to get another brush by from the Max Pack squash set. It's called Bristle. And I love this brush because it's like um, very like soft and blendy, but also grainy. So that works really well. And then when I, so I always feel like um, my main tip for color is like if you have a starting point and you gradually add color from there. So you like pick one color to start and then you kind of like add a second color that fits with the first and you add a third color that fits with the other two. If you kind of move out from a starting point, it's a lot easier to make them work together than throwing them all together and then wrestling them to make them work. You know what I mean? So I always try to uh, have my starting point and then based on that, I'll, I'll kind of like look here and kind of search for that second second tone. And, and in this little circle that's like floating over the color box, <laughs> I'm probably not using the right term. Um, <laughs> you can see like how the colors interact together. You can see like the, the first color and then the second color on the right side. And so you can kind of test like how much contrast you want and how, how close you want them to be and how, how contrasting do you want them to be. And I, I just use my intuition for that. And then I have my second color and I can start working that in and already like the whole color scheme feels different once you add a second tone. And another thing that I always do that I say in literally every live demo, literally every tip I'll give is to change the color of your lines. Um, so if you have like what I have here, like pretty desaturated lines that are like a grayish color, like change, change the, the color of those lines to something else. Like I could go for like a more reddish tone or maybe something more pink. Like I'm just going to experiment with these sliders and see what works. But as soon as you change the color of your lines, the whole color scheme feels completely different. Like it just comes together uh, in a way. And another thing that I love about this is that um, once you've changed the color of your line, so right now I've, I've got like a reddish kind of line color, um, there's like all these new colors where the, the lines multiply on the base uh, the base color. So we've got like some darker, like brownish tones, but we've also got some light, like medium tones here. And we've got more reddish tones here where the lines multiply onto the base color. So it instantly gives you so much color to work with. Um, so it's like a fast and easy way to, to work out a color scheme. And I'm just going to like pick colors that are already here and just kind of like blend them in to, to the, the color scheme. All right. I think I'm just going to keep it like kind of a minimal color scheme. Like a lot of like there's these sort of basics that work, right? Like with color, if you have two complementary colors, they tend to work well together. If you have like a warm and a cool tone that tends to work together. And right now I'm using a trick, which is just similar color range, like just using a lot of colors that are very similar to one another that just also tends to work well. And these are just like tried and tested approaches that are easy and fast. This is around the point in the stream where I get distracted and stop asking questions because I'm too interested in what's happening on the stream. <laughs> so <laughs> um, maybe I should find another question from the audience. Uh, Miriam would like to know, uh, what are your thoughts or what would your response be to people who say that you can't make a career in the arts? Um, I say that's a really difficult topic. Um, I assume that the question means like it, that if somebody comes up to a any person and says you can't make a career off of the arts um, and not you specifically, right? Because if somebody's like, mm. you specifically cannot make a career, then it's a different yeah, it's harsh. argument. <laughs> it's harsh. Yeah. I've heard it before. Um, 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. There's a, for some reason with art, as soon as you're an artist, people feel the need to like dump a lot of unsolicited advice on you. I don't know what mm-hmm. that is. Um, but yeah, uh, my advice is you can make a living off of art. It's possible. It's always been possible. Uh, so it's obviously like just patently false. Um, it is hard. It, it with art, it's sort of like um, like an unregulated Wild West kind of situation. Like if you want to be a doctor, you have to follow a certain type of education and then you get like a certain kind of certificate and, and it all is very official. You know, it's very clear who is a doctor and who's not. And with art, it's like anybody can make art and anybody can pursue a living in art. So it's much harder to say, what is the, the skill set that we need? You know, what is mm. and what is going to work and what isn't? And like I said earlier, the, the industry is changing a lot and fast all the time. You know, new technologies are appearing all the time, too. So it's really hard to say, you know, if you have a certain skill set, is that what it takes to make a living? You don't know. And something that might help now might not be helpful in five years from now. So it's it's much more... I think unclear um, what what will get you successful in the art industry and what won't. And I think that that's what concerns parents a lot. If you say like, I'm going to pursue art, I think they're like, but what will happen to you? You know what I mean? So Mm -hmm. um, I think that that's why a lot of people get unsolicited advice from like relatives or teachers or like older people in their lives saying, well, you can't make a living off of that because it's like much harder to say like whether you'll be successful or not, as opposed to a different kind of job where you get like a certificate or a degree and you follow a clearer path. So, um, but having said that, like there's many options and in, in my, all I can say is in my personal situation, I have been able to make a living off of art and I've been able to make a living off of my art in a way that I didn't expect because I always shared my work online and because of that opportunities came up. Um, I have a a big online following. I have a lot of exposure and that helped me find work that I never thought I would be able to have. And, and so that's how it worked out for me. And I also want to say that like for a lot of people, it doesn't work out in terms of like getting rich from art, you know, but, or even doing art full time, like some people do art part time, and they also have another job on the side, or, you know, like a setup where that allows them to live to some extent off of art. And that's also perfectly valid. Um, So I think that it just depends a lot on your personal situation, and how much you want to do it and also how much time do you give yourself to figure out what works and what doesn't work for you for some people you know it's it's a like they become they they make a living off of art and they're very happy doing that and some people are like well I can make a living off of art but it makes me unhappy because it's exhausting <laughs> and then they they take a you know they they decide to to tone it down so i guess the point that i'm trying to make is that it is possible and that um, and that it will be different for everybody, and that uh, whether you want to pursue it as a career depends on, you know, like it, it's it's uh, an unclear path, so to speak. It's like you can't say like this is exactly how it's going to go, but it is an option. And when people people tell you you can't make a living off of it, it's like obviously not true. And you can try and pursue a living off of it. And if it doesn't work out exactly the way you want it to, to do. You're not alone. Like art is like, like I said, like a kind of wild west, like for some people it works out and for other people it like takes unexpected twists and turns. I feel like my answer might be overly nuanced, but that, that, that's, no, those I think are my it's thoughts. really helpful. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And we can only ever speak from personal experience. So that's really great. Um, yeah, and it depends so much on, on your like location and situations in your life and like th- things that are sort of maybe outside of your control a little bit as well, like mm. trends and also things that are, you know, some people don't get as many opportunities in our, in this industry as other people. Mm. And that's also like not always our own fault. So whether you can make a living off of it is like you have to 
you have to find if you're passionate enough to do it, you have to do it and try, but don't always blame yourself when things don't go exactly as you want. Because when people are like, oh, you know, if you have like an uncle saying you can't make a living off of that, you feel like maybe an insane amount of pressure to prove that you can. But it's not always your fault if it doesn't go the way you want. Like, I think most artists have like a lot of bumps and detours and and struggles along the way. And you have to do it for you in the end. That's what it comes down to. You have to do it yeah. for yourself. Definitely. Um, touching back on social media, because you're like OG DeviantArt, Lois. I like personally myself remember back when I was high, in high school finding your work on DeviantArt. Um, and just like outing myself <laughs> here, yeah. So like, old, no way, uh, way, way back, Lois fan, haha. <laughs> um, <laughs> but your social media presence now, I mean, on DeviantArt too, but on your other social media platforms like Instagram and now Twitter and stuff too, it's it's really big. You've got a massive following. So how do you go about managing your time and your expectations with that? Because social media can be such a time suck. I mean, there's a reason that I have it for a full time job, right? It's really time yeah. consuming. So how do you about go about managing that time and expectations of it? Um, that's something that's evolved a lot over time. Like when I first kind of build a following, by the way, I'm doing like a multiply layer now on top of the whole image. That's like just a light kind of grayish, like grayish pinkish color as a multiply layer, just to add like a little bit more shadows. Um, but yeah, when I first sort of started on social media, it was purely for fun. Like when I, I sound like a dinosaur right now. I am a dinosaur. I'm 35. <laughs> um, but like That's when I started, <laughs> when I started on DeviantArt, social media, that word didn't even exist. Like it wasn't widely used and nobody was really making a living off of social media, at least as far as I know. Um, the term influencer didn't exist and... It wasn't a way to like make make money. It was just a way to like share your work and it was for fun. So that's how it started for me. It was just low key, uh, just just my kind of escape from, you know, the real world. <laughs> I think we all kind of relate to that, like going to the internet to yeah. get away from the real world. Um, you know, uh, high school, college, whatever. And then by the time I graduated, things had changed a lot because then suddenly there was Twitter, there was Facebook, there was like Instagram was quite new and like more and more people were sharing their work online and the art community was getting like bigger and bigger online. Um, but I still like the idea of making a living off of social media was like quite new, but I did get a lot of like potential clients through it. So um, I started to see it more and more as like a professional thing. Like I realized like, you know, people would be like, oh, we were looking on DeviantArt for inspiration for our new project and we saw your drawing, you know, maybe you want to work on this project. So I realized that I was getting opportunities from it uh, for client work. So I started like, you know, whenever there was a new platform, I would join it and see if I could promote my art on there. And I tried to kind of like roll with the times, um, kind of understand what the new trends were. And over time, like being on social media became a, you know, a job practically. Um, mm. I think a lot of people assume that if you have a lot of followers on social media that you are making money off of your posts or whatever. Like I've had like awkward family like interactions where people are like, so how much money do you make per post? And I'm like, uh, I don't make any money on my posts, but <laughs> you get like exposure. Um, and, and, and in my case, I try to send people to my Patreon and stuff like that. So over time, as it became more and more of like a professional thing to do, like social media presence became part of like a business strategy. I started, uh, approaching it more as such. So initially I would just post whenever and I would do it for fun. And now I plan out my social media posts every Friday, Friday afternoon. Uh, I just post, uh, I, I plan out three posts ahead of time. And I, uh, I write out my posts so that I, I post at a regular rate and, and, um, and I, I just try to keep up with it in that way. Uh, I try to plan it in and make sure that like, I'm, um, cause 
Okay, so another thing. <laughs> Everybody <laughs> gather around the campfire with internet grandma. Uh, initially, <laughs> when when we when you posted art on social media, you know, in the Deviant Art days, or even like early social media, like um, Tumblr and Twitter, the feed was chronological, and uh, oh, now yeah. everything is like algorithmic. So the algorithm kind of decides what you want to see. So as somebody who's posting on social media, you have to try and like reach your existing followers, right? You have to be like, hey, I, you follow me. Do you want to see my posts? Because like you don't even see all of the posts of the people you follow. So you have to post regularly and you have to post when people are online. Whereas before on DeviantArt, you could post like once a month, you know, or like once every two months. Yeah. And then people would catch up to your older posts eventually. Like people would go through all their posts and be like, oh, hey. Uh, Lois posted last month. I'll comment on that. And now if I post something, nobody even remembers what I posted last month. Like it's <laughs> ancient history now. So it goes really fast. Um, so you have to post regularly. So that's, that's how I try to approach it. Like just, um, just, just keeping up, uh, with my social media posts. And over time, I've been very lucky to accumulate a following and I, I'm just, I think it's a lot of the reason why is because I've just been posting for such a long time and I am and people have seen me grow and change over time. And a lot of people like like you, Georgie, are like, wow, I saw your post when I was in high school, you know, which is like the craziest thing. Um, <laughs> but that's that's something that I'm, I'm very lucky that I, I never planned it this way. And now I can say that I'm incredibly lucky and uh, I'm really grateful for the followers that I have. But it, it was never like a plan from the start which is just, it's, I feel a lot of um, sympathy for people who are uh, like just coming on to the social media scene and want to use it for their, their art because it's a very saturated scene now. There's like a lot of people mm. in it and uh, it's very hard to get noticed compared to before. Yeah, definitely. And with our, our good friend, the algorithm messing everything up yes. for a lot of people and, you know, the <laughs> the pressures of social media platforms trying to push you in certain directions with new yeah. features that they introduce, it can be so overwhelming and so difficult for new artists to even be seen. Yeah, um, I always say that it's yeah. like a treadmill. It's like a treadmill that keeps going faster and faster and faster over time. I think that's and... a really good way to put it. Yeah, and it's like merciless. <laughs> and, you, and when people are like, oh, it's not working out on social media, I'm posting, but nothing's working. I'm like, you know, you're not alone. It sucks for like mm. almost everyone. It is completely unrealistic. And I think these days it's better to say, wow, this just doesn't work for me rather than blame yourself all the time, right? Because it's, it's impossible. Yeah. All yeah, right, so I've got- for the algorithm in the comments. <laughs> yeah. I think all the yeah. artists feel the pain. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I've got I've got everything merged together now. So like I initially had, you know, this sort of starting sketch and I made a more detailed sketch on top and then added like basic colors to that. Like the color layer is just is quite soft and keeping in a similar color range. And now I've kind of like, I've put that all in a group together and duplicated that and merged it. So it's all on one layer now, everything's merged. And you can see like all of those original sketch lines, like those, those um, softer sketch lines that were here are still like in the drawing, but they've just become part of the overall piece. Like they've merged together. And now I'm gonna start detailing from this one layer. It's so interesting to see the colors underneath the line work and how that really changes. Yeah, I, I love seeing, like, keeping those loose lines in there gives gives it some color dimension, you know, it gives it some texture mm -hmm. and some life. And I, I love that. And I, I merge them all together as well because it's like really easy to make color adjustments now. So I can just like go to my color balance and kind of like change the color scheme of the whole thing. I could be like, all right, I'm taking a, it's, it's going neon now, you know, and go with that. <laughs> although I'm not going to, but it is an option. <laughs> That's what's fun about digital art. Now I'm going to make probably more, some more subtle changes. I've got a question from Alexandra. It was a little while back, but basically uh, she's a beginner. She's moving from traditional to digital. And she was wondering if you had any tips about that workflow because she's struggling a little bit. Um, 
Yeah, a lot of people say that. Um, a lot of people are kind of getting back into drawing or just starting out and they are more like adept with traditional media and they're not sure where to start with digital. And I always recommend like, you know, as far as tools go, all right, I'm going to be totally frank on this Procreate live stream, but like I am not a fan of Apple products. I've always been like a Android <laughs> user <laughs> and I got um, the iPad for this, like for being able to sketch. And honestly, like I was like, oh, I have a Cintiq. I don't need an iPad. But then a friend of mine came over with an iPad and was like, test this out. And I just like drew a line and it was so extremely responsive. Like I drew a line and I was like, oh, it's just there nothing happened <laughs> like oh my god like um the Cintiq and Photoshop has a lag and I've I'm used to it I'm used to that lag I don't notice it um but like on the iPad it's just not there it's so fast and it's insane like I really think it, when I I was like I drew one line and I was like I'm buying it right now and I instantly bought it um <laughs> which is you know for for an for an avid Android user was a big step um, but like, yeah. I do recommend, you know, if you can, you know, afford, um, an iPad and procreate and you can kind of play on that. I think for traditional artists, it comes quite close to the experience of drawing on paper because it is very responsive, very fast textured brushes don't lag. They seem quite natural and you can just sit on your couch with it, like with a sketchbook. So that's why I think it's an interesting choice. Um, and, uh, so I, and I recommend kind of using this sort of approach, uh, that I'm showing here. So just sketch, just doodle and maybe try adding like, you know, a layer of color to that sketch, but don't, you don't have to try everything. You don't have to learn everything. You can just take it really slow and just start with just doodling and sketching mindlessly. And I think you'll find your way from there. So that's what I definitely recommend to people going from traditional to digital is like, keep it super simple and, and just try sketching first. Sometimes sketches are enough. You don't have to like make a proper painting or a finished piece until you're ready. And that's, that's how I learned as well. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Kate in the comments says that, oh, uh, sorry, it wasn't Kate. The comments just moved. Drawing with Sunflower said that they went from traditional mediums to doing digital art on their phone. Oh my goodness. That's that is, hardcore. That's amazing. Props to you. Um, I learned how to draw digital art with like a, a ball mouse. I don't think they even Oof. exist anymore. You remember those? Like a mouse. Yes. It has like a ball in it. <laughs> oh my goodness. And you have to like <laughs> pop the ball out and clean it every now and then. Yeah, you have to scrape all the dirt out of it. <laughs> God, I learned so how to draw with those and <laughs> and it was so hard to like get a straight line. It was literally impossible. So I used like oh a, a, a like one of those bezel kind of tools. So yeah. it was like uh you know you you draw two you you click from one point to the next and then you get like <laughs> some so, <laughs> some methods to curve the line. And that's like all of my old art is like that. And it's like oh. in paint and stuff. But oh, drawing on your phone is like that. It's like the current day version of that. It's <laughs> like, hard mode I have no, sure. I have no tools or means to do this. I will use whatever I have. Oh. <laughs> but I mean, that's a great place to start, right? It, you know, challenge. I think it is Challenges the best place to good. start because also you set a <laughs> limit. You basically tell yourself like, there's only so much I can do with this. So literally everything feels like a victory. And yeah, and you learn the basics first, you have to limit yourself to the basics, because otherwise, you're gonna find yourself, you know, working on some kind of extremely complex tutorial about how to build a space in 3d with like five different lighting setups, and you'll get lost, you know. <laughs> I'm, I'm impressed by people Elkie who can do that. But... <laughs> oh, God, me too. Elkie in the comments saying that, uh, oh, my God, I'm getting wrist pain just from thinking about you drawing with a bowl mouse. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know how I didn't get, I didn't get any wrist issues from that stuff. I was drawing with a mouse oh. like three or four. I was drawing like, okay, so I was like a, an idiot teenager who would just like 
stay i would do my homework until like 11 p.m and then i'd be like it's drawing time until like 5 a.m <laughs> i don't know if there was a part of my brain that considered sleep as an important thing but i just didn't do it and i would just draw with my mouse like literally all night until my mother woke up and if she caught me still up drawing she would be like what is wrong with you you are not normal <laughs> she literally said that um oh. <laughs> and I mean, I didn't even get any issues, you know, with my arm from that. I got issues with my arm from client work uh, later in uh, life. And I think that mm -hmm. that I think that my mindset when I was learning to draw with the mouse was like, I'm having fun and and that that kept things from getting really bad. And when I was working at, for a client, I was like, I have to do this. I have to do this. I have to prove myself. I have to be better. And that was was a huge catalyst of the the injury that I had so mm. I think that mindset plays a huge role like I think posture and like you have to take care of your health but I I think an even bigger part of it is take care of your mental health and make sure that you're like you know relaxed when you draw because that's even more important yeah and you're a really passionate advocate for mental health in the arts we've seen you talk on it before seen you on panels about it um, at different events around the world, what are some of the best tips that you have for people to be able to, I guess, tell themselves that it's okay to step back and to take care of themselves first? Uh, I have a lot of thoughts on that. We'll start with the history of mental health. No, I'm kidding. Um, but like, <laughs> uh, I recently did a tutorial about this actually, because people asked me to make a tutorial on like exercises and warm ups for beginners. Right. And, and I realized, uh, also not for beginners, but like for starting out with your drawing as well, like, um, and to improve. And I realized that mindset is, is even more important, I think, than like what you literally draw. Um, because like, you know, in order to learn and improve, like you just have to be, you have to be in a mindset where you allow yourself to learn new things. And that's like hard, you know, um, to get into that mindset. Cause like, if you're a perfectionist, I am a perfectionist, then you'll be like, oh, how, you know, this isn't good enough. I'm learning. I'm not learning fast enough. I'm not doing this right. Like, I still have too much to learn. I'll never get there, blah, blah, blah. And you have all these negative thoughts. And it's so important to just be in a mindset where you, like, let yourself learn. Like, give yourself permission to make mistakes, to be in a process to just draw something that isn't your best work because literally like you cannot always draw your best work. And, and that is, is so important f to grow and improve. So that's why mental, I think mental health for artists is so important. It's not just because it's good for us to be in a better state, but also because like you literally won't improve and learn if you are not like giving yourself that space. And mm -hmm. More importantly, like I've just, you know, you've okay. So when I joined the art community, it was all like people doing great, you know, like, oh, I'm, I'm doing, I'm making my best art. I'm having my moment. Like I have my, a great deviant art uh, gallery. Like I saw a lot of artists thrive, but I also have seen a lot of artists get blocked and like kind of fade away or be like disappear from the scene for a while. And I've seen, mm -hmm. I've seen so much of that and that is um, I think like almost a, a bigger challenge than improving and growing as an artist is uh, maintaining your creativity over a long period of time and mental health is essential to that and and I think literally every single artist has gone through some form of art block it's like an almost universal experience for artists so, and it's a huge issue. It's like a bigger issue than a lot of other stuff that's going on. Like, you know, how much somebody should improve or like, how do I build my career? It's like, how do you stay creative and feel good about your art? Yeah. Um, so that's, that's why I talk about that a lot. Um, I think it's really important uh, subject. And I think the main thing is that you have to like, let go of perfectionism. Uh, that's what mm. I always tell people. Yeah, okay. absolutely. I think one of the biggest things that I see being online uh, every day with the art community is a lot of newbies and amateurs coming up and they're trying to get somewhere in their career and they're seeing all these incredible artists and 
they just think it's like magic. This artist gets from A to Z um, perfectly with no struggle. But then when you get some of these amazing artists online being really authentic and being really open about that production line almost, it's kind of like a wake up call for them that, oh, actually, you know, everyone goes through a process for making their work and everyone struggles. And I think it's so important that people realize that it's not just, you know, people don't just wake up and do this. It's no, definitely not. And I, and, and, and any artists like kind of, you know, got to where they, they got from making mistakes and going through rough patches and, you know, um, stumbling and falling or having like a less perfect art phase. Um, that's why it's also, this is also on YouTube, but like for Lightbox, me and my, a friend of mine, Iris Compete or Iris Compete, we like did a, a, like a sort of talking session where we talked through our old work and, and we talked about like, you know, how we started out, like our awkward first drawings and also <laughs> about like phases where we were like not feeling great about our work and not in a good creative flow. And, and Iris is somebody who found her sort of career path much later in life. Like she had pursued a career in, in children's books, illustrations, and she like didn't make it in that world. And then she quit and started doing her own thing. And from that, her career sort of like blossomed. And I think yeah. that it's really important for us to share that, you know, because when we learn in art history about all the great artists, we never see their awkward and embarrassing. Like, I don't know if Picasso ever drew like, you know, anime fan art. I'm pretty sure he didn't. But like <laughs> nowadays, all of the big artists that we see, like they had those phases, like they all had their oh, awkward yeah. phases. And we can share that with each other now and like kind of dispel the myth of the artist who was born talented because that literally mm. doesn't exist. Yeah, I think Iris is a fantastic example of someone who found their thing after a, a certain amount of time. I love how she's so open with that in events and panels, um, yeah. even online. I've seen a lot of that stuff from her on Twitter, for example. Yeah, she's very like uh, open about it and very supportive to other artists and mm. willing to tell her story. And I think that that's really important because I, I'm not a big fan of like successful artists pushing the narrative that it was all like oh I just worked really hard and I drew every day and I pushed myself and I pushed myself until I became my final form you know like I don't think that's how it really works <laughs> I think that that's a myth you know uh I think that it's much more like you stumble and you fall and you find your way and you make mistakes and you reassess and whatever like it's it's a messy process and there's no reason to like make it seem more appealing than it than it is yeah definitely yeah a lot of a lot of that same sentiment in the chat there a lot of people going yep that's about it <laughs> i've got a question from harry here this was a little while back as well um harry wanted to know do you have any favorite artists oh yeah i have a lot of favorite artists um I mean, I've got like the classics, right? I always have to give a shout out to like my biggest inspirations. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, Alphonse Mucha, who do the Art Nouveau posters. And mm. uh, Lion Decker, who do like these 20s illustrations, like covers for the New York Post, which are just gorgeous. Um, huge inspirations for me still. And then, of course, like now, I'd say one of my favorite uh, artists is Andrew Hem, who makes like these beautiful oh, yeah. emotional paintings with like that just feel like dreams and memories, um, but like beautiful textures and colors to them. Mm -hmm. I was lucky enough to see one of his talks at IFCC in oh, 2019. Gosh. Yeah. Yeah. He was I great. I would love to see that. I mean, he's he's amazing and I recently saw his art in a documentary a really cool documentary about um like donut shops in LA which are like right most of the donut donut shops in LA are owned by Cambodian people of Cambodian descent because of like right. a guy who came to the to LA and started up donut shops and like helped set up shops for other like Cambodian immigrants 
and his art wow. was in it. And there was like these animation sequences that were in his style and he did the, the cover art. And it was just so cool because I his work just touches so much on like feelings about the past and like memories mm. I, that's how that's what i get from it so his art is just super beautiful and inspiring to me um and for the rest like i tend to get my inspiration from like all sorts of different random pictures like i just see a drawing and i'm like i love that drawing and i've lately i'd say like my my how i follow artists has become more fragmented over time like i used to follow everything an artist did but now yeah. I just see like a drawing come by that I like and then another drawing come by. So they all seem like because of the way social media works these days, it's harder to follow like everything one artist does. And it becomes more like a bunch of different stuff coming at you. Yeah. Oh, wait, I keep doing this wrong. I keep picking pencil. There we go. Sassy J has just arrived. The artist is Lois Van Baal. You'll know her online as Loish. I'm sure you've seen her art. <laughs> <laughs> Queen Nokia, I think half your question's been cut off. I'm going to change to a more creamy kind of brush right now. So this is one from the Rasm Ink brush set. That's like a softer, more blendy brush. I'm going to use that to kind of like paint a little more. Super says, yeah, we know her. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks everyone who came out and who's, who's dropping comments. I'm seeing them come by and I feel like I'm with people, which is really nice. <laughs> it's been weird. Like in this pandemic time, I've really missed like meeting new people or feeling like being like we're in a big group together mm, right. and doing stuff like streams and online events kind of like creates that feeling. Yeah. How have you found the change from in-person to events to uh, online digital events? Because obviously you go to quite a few events around the world. Yeah. Um, I, I miss like the fun, like the socializing part. Yeah. Getting to know people, uh, like meeting new people. I really miss that a lot, but the online events have also been really fun because you just get to like, you know, sit in your pajamas and like <laughs> give a talk in your own house. Cause like the traveling part of it and like being out of my element and in a place that like I've never been before, like being away from home was pretty tiring. Like it's nice and it's fun, but it's also like it, it grates on you after a while. Yeah. I do think that after this, pandemic is over fingers crossed that it will one day end <laughs> not to get too pessimistic um i do think i'll be traveling a little less and i hope that more of these online events will continue to exist because i also think that a lot of people were able to participate in them that would normally not be able to make it all the way out uh to yeah. you know, la or wherever these events are taking place so it's in a way it's also like more inclusive and that's something that i do appreciate but it's, it's, yeah. yeah, it's missing the face-to-face -face stuff a lot. Yeah, definitely. It's um, something that we at Procreate have also found. It's because we usually go to, I think it's around three events roughly per year. Like we're always at playgrounds, um, for example, in the, in Europe and yeah. we went to Lightbox the first year, obviously. Um, and it's, I personally really, really miss meeting everyone hanging out with everyone like it's i was talking to um you know leon loish the yeah the director i guess of playgrounds um a yeah. while back and we were kind of discussing about you know the any upcoming events that sort of thing blah blah, blah. 
and he was showing us the the after movie he'd made from the previous event and I just like I teared up oh it was yeah like, I kind of felt really homesick yeah it was a really bizarre situation but yeah, yeah. it's it's so there's a lot that's been lost and especially like I think it's really important at events like this that younger people who are trying to find their way in the industry and learning about it and getting advice from people who are meeting the artists they look up to, that they get the chance to talk and ask yeah. spontaneous questions. And I think now it's it must, must be a lot harder for younger people to kind of like figure out where they stand in this industry and have like that connection. And I, I worry about that a little bit, but hopefully, you know, fingers crossed that this, this will be over soon. <laughs> yeah, fingers crossed for sure. It's so been a year. Think, yeah. Uh, yeah, right? It's a, a year ago, it's, it, it, it year got already. bad. All of my photos of like specifically a year ago, like if I go to my Google photos and I see what, what's been in my camera roll since a year ago, it's like all coronavirus oh. memes. Because that's the only <laughs> way that, that I figured out how to cope. <laughs> Oh, the one true communication method of 2020. Yeah, it was like, oh, oh, this is this is so emotionally difficult. Let's make memes. Like, I really that was <laughs> that got me through for sure. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh man. Yeah. So, do you think that? Um, I mean, as you said, fingers crossed. Hopefully, it ends. Soon. Fingers crossed. Yes. Um, when <laughs> when our art events are up and going in person again, is the are they something that you would totally recommend that um aspiring artists and newbies go to you see that they have a real value for up-and-comers in the community uh yeah i think it depends on the events uh certain events mm. like kind of facilitate um n networking and spontaneous conversation like more than others um but when i was at lightbox i had a great time i loved it um, yeah and, and playgrounds too. And I met a lot of people, new people. So I, I really do uh, think, I do recommend it if you have like, if you're young and you're trying to figure out how you feel about the industry or you're learning and you look, you look up to specific artists and you want to like know their experience, I would definitely go to like playgrounds or lightbox and just walk right up to people and just start a conversation. And even if you're shy, you know, everybody in the art community is a little bit awkward, so it's no problem. Like, <laughs> and just get that information and get your name out there. And um, I, I really, I think that there's a lot of added value to younger people just to feel like they're building connections in the community and getting answers to the questions that they have. Because I remember when I was in school, um, I didn't have answers to so many questions. And I had to kind of figure it out as I went and it worked out in the end. But like, it would have been great if somebody had been like, oh, no, no, you don't have to worry about that specific thing. No, this is your portfolio. You know, you could try this and that. Like somebody with experience kind of like guiding me in a way, because like I just had a lack of guidance. It's not anybody's fault. Yeah. Like I was also extremely antisocial and I didn't talk to people. But like <laughs> it's sort of my own fault. But like that kind of guidance helps a lot. So I do recommend, especially if you're somebody who like, just doesn't know how, what your path is going to be and, and you want to learn more. Those events are excellent for that. Oh, Enrico here says that he's got to speak to you at Playgrounds in 2019. Yay. And it was so nice. <laughs> Playgrounds is way fun. Playgrounds is also very informal. One of the most informal of all the events that I've been to. Oh, yeah. Um, because it, like, we all go to, like, it's small, right? And there's, like, a, like, a, a kind of pub, like, a kind of bar, restaurant type thing right next door. And everybody goes it's there. So and everybody chats <laughs> together. And it's, it's just super low key. And also, if you ever see me at an event and you're like, I don't know what to do or say, I feel out of my element, like, you can always come up to me and just say, that like it's socializing for me it took me a long time to get into the flow of socializing because like I was really like not a social person as a teenager and as a young person um but really like I I just feel like there's um 
like we can all look out for each other and yeah. that's something that i miss a lot actually <laughs> yeah me too i think it's it's interesting to find out that so many people feel that way i've got a lot of people in the comments saying that they're they are introverts or they were introverts as well and me myself i was exactly the same i was not very good at socializing with people i'm still i still struggle sometimes um, would you believe I haven't it? noticed. Um, uh, but definitely in person, like I get a little bit of that anxiety and I definitely did as a teenager for sure. Like I just was not good at talking to people. Um, but I think going to those events was really, really good for me, really cool for me and finding, you know, that oh, all of these people who are creating such incredible stuff, you know, like they're just people. Everyone's yeah. just people. They're yeah exactly that support each other yeah that's that's the appeal i think is like just humanizing the industry because especially yeah. when you're like new to the industry or you you don't you may you might have some imposter syndrome or something then it just seems like everybody else has has it all together and you mm. don't and when you go there you just realize that everybody's just indeed just a person and yeah. I don't know. They kind of changed my life because I know I avoided uh, events for the longest time because I, I just I was just like I had an intense stage fright as well. So like I didn't want to get up in front of people and say like I also had this thing where it's like people would be like, do you want to talk about your experiences? And I'm like, who cares about my experience? <laughs> I have nothing to say on this subject. I am a nobody. You know, I don't know. Some kind of like stubborn insistence that I had nothing to contribute and mm. going to these events made me realize like it's not about whether your perspective is worthy of contribution it's like everybody is just sharing stuff with each other and yeah. and it's it's okay like it's it's it just like breaks down those walls a little bit and and honestly like i hate getting on stage and and talking about stuff in front of people but it's always worth it in the end for the connections that you make it's, it's yeah. worth it for like somebody coming up to you afterwards and being like, yeah, I, I went through a similar thing. And then, and that's like, that's truly like amazing. And I think the same, I mean, I can see now in the chat that people are like kind of sharing their experiences and talking, kind of saying yeah. how it is for them. That is just the best. That is like human connection. And, and that's what I love about this sort of stuff. And I think artists who are generally quite introverted could use a lot, like more of that sometimes right so that's why I, I really recommend it and for now the online events also do a great job of like facilitating conversations between people and kind of breaking down those barriers and the isolation that can sometimes happen if you're an artist mm, definitely the use of discord is really really helpful with those online platforms oh yeah for sure Oh, so nice to see so many people in the comments with the, the same experiences, supporting each other. You guys are all so cool. Yeah, it's a hard time, I'm I think. I'm not sure for... I understand. My goodness. Whew, What's that? Siri just, that was Siri. She activated. <laughs> oh, scared me so much. <laughs> <laughs> she didn't understand uh, what you said. <laughs> she didn't understand. Oh, easy for Siri. She can talk to anyone. Yeah, Siri doesn't get oh introversion goodness. at all. <laughs> Not at all. She's, She's friends with a whenever. lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Oh, my heart is racing. Oh god. Uh, it's um We have that all the time with mentioned. our Google, like our uh Oh um, yeah. What's, what's it called again? No, no, the Google one. Um Oh, that's the Amazon. Yeah, um yeah, the Google one, and it, it? it often, like, it went through a phase where it was giving us, like, Ethiopian translations of, like, random stuff. And we oh, were what? like, yeah, like, in, like, oh, that, uh, let me translate that for you. And it would translate, like, a <laughs> sentence in a language that we'd never heard before. And we'd be like, this is cool, but we didn't ask for it, you know? And also, like, in oh, movies, all the time, it thinks that it's giving us, like, it thinks that we're giving it instructions because of, like, movie dialogue. Oh. It's, Yeah. <laughs> it's oh, fine. <laughs> oh my goodness. I do I'm Siri is usually pretty good for me. I did have a good one. Oh, she's gonna activate again. Here we go. <laughs> Don't say her oh, name. There we go. <laughs> Don't say her name. 
I had a good one today where I'd, <laughs> I'd, um, I'd asked her to leave me a reminder for later tonight to do something, to post something to social media. And the yeah. reminder went off and she told me that um, your reminder for 6 p.m. is that you're supposed to eat a taxi. <laughs> and I just, I don't really know how she got that. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. Boris has done yeah, that a couple times too. Yeah. <laughs> if any of y'all know how uh, I'm supposed to figure out how to eat a taxi, please hit me up. That's yeah. really I still helpful. I still can't get into the flow of like talking to talking to a computer. I I just can't like I just do it all like this is another thing with me and my boyfriend. Like my boyfriend is like, you can just tell Google to do it. And I'm like, I don't want to. I'm gonna type it. It's gonna take way longer, but I just I don't trust this talking thing, you know? Oh, it's like voicemail probably... when you leave a voicemail and you're like oh. hi i'm and then you mess it up and you're like no oh my god no no delete <laughs> delete <laughs> i'm getting pretty good at it but one thing i can't get over is being like exceedingly polite to her oh, right. like i can't just say oh do this thing i have to be like hey can you please do this for me and then she does uh... it and i'm like yeah thank you Oh, and that's then, so like, sweet. We say mean things to our Google uh, Google oh, assistant really? sometimes. Yeah, and then he says, I'm sorry, I'm learning to be better. And then I feel so oh. bad. <laughs> oh, did you ever see that Black Mirror episode? I don't think I finished all of Black Mirror. I got too creeped out. Oh, um, gosh. Well, it was such I a sad episode. I think I finished episode. season one, though. There was, like, an episode where, like, okay, I might be spoiling it for people. So, like, spoiler, if, if you don't like Black Mirror spoilers, you got to mute me now. But uh, there's the one episode where they they create a home assistant by cloning somebody's soul and putting Ooh. it into, like, an empty white room. And, like, they break the will of that person because, like, when they wake up in this white room, they're like, get me out of this place. And then they're like, no you have to be your own assistant for the rest of your life. And so then like a oh piece God. of your soul is in the assistant. And because it's your soul, it knows exactly how you want your toast and it knows when you want the lights on and stuff. Oh. And it lives forever mm. inside. <laughs> well, it's too real. <laughs> it's too real. I think about that every time I use my assistant. I'm like, is there a soul in there? Anyway, I, that is this is such a tangent. I need to get back on the art. Sorry about that. <laughs> oh, all started from my watch. Oh goodness. I have to remember <laughs> next time on a stream I need to disable all of the series in my surrounding area. Oh goodness. How are you doing, Georgie? It's quite late where you are. I'm doing surprisingly well considering that I am a morning person and not a night person. Oh right. Um Wow, That's a so morning I'm person. Getting a lot of advice. I don't think I've ever met a morning person. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, man. That's incredible. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm good with mornings. It's my time to shine. Gosh, um, I'm terrible. It doesn't help that, that I have a, I have a uh, Shetland Sheepdog who likes oh, yeah. to tell me that it's time to wake up. So... That's... Yeah, that's great. It's not the Border Collie. He sleeps all the time. It's the Shetland Sheepdog in her crate dragging her claws down the side of the cage so that it makes this scratchy sound <laughs> wake up dogs always know pets always know how to like how to get you with the wake up stuff you know oh yeah Absolutely. like my cat used to body slam our bedroom door <laughs> like with her whole body and she was like quite big she she would just like oh, slam her butt into the door she was exceptionally uh will willful <laughs> <laughs> oh do you have any pets currently nope no we uh we lost our kitty um like how long ago was it three years ago we're still not really over it so yeah yeah, yeah but we have a they lot of cats really in the neighborhood that come visit all the time Oh, guest yeah. cats are always fun. Yeah, they like all drop by and say hello, and sometimes they come inside. So we have like kitty love in our life, but just not oh. of our, from our own cat. That's okay. 
there's a friendly yeah. cat on my morning walk route as well. It likes to runs out of the house and just comes over. And, oh like, my god, demands those... pats from you. Oh, that's my favorite thing when they come out with their tail up and they're like, oh yeah, super vocal. <laughs> oh, oh my god. And it's very cute. It has made best friends with the aforementioned Shetland Sheepdog of mine. It's adorable. Oh, a they cat just and kind a dog of like, that are friends. This is like my yeah, favorite they just like thing. run towards each other on the street and just like they don't quite understand each other, which is hilarious. The cat oh. doesn't quite understand that my dog is trying to play and dog doesn't yeah. understand that the cat is trying to rub against her. And it's just that's so cute though. My oh goodness. god. Yeah, that's one of those things, right? Because, like, I grew up with dogs, so I I knew, I know when a dog wants to play. It's like, Mm. they wag their tail and they do the, like, jump thing with their front legs, Mm. right? They, like, get down on their front legs and then they run. And it's like, uh, with cats, it took me so long to understand cats. Like, for a long time, I was like, what are you thinking? Like, I literally, like, when we just got our cat, I was like, I don't know what's in your mind right now. And if I was alone with her, I would be like, just giving her these awkward looks, like, what does she want? And over time, I really learned how the dog, um, how the cat body language works, like all the subtle things, you know, with like the tail and like the half closed eyes and the slow blinks and took so long. The slow blinks mean like, I love you, right? Yeah, that means they're like super relaxed. Yeah. They're just- I'm not good with cat body language, but I know that one. Yeah, it means they're, like, really chill. And, like, with cats, you can just tell, like, if their eyes are very wide open and their pupils are big, they're, like, super activated. And they might just pounce you <laughs> with their claws. And um, when they're, like, their eyes are closed and they're just, like, you, you can also feel it on their skin. Like, when you touch them and their skin is softer, they're relaxed because right. they relax their muscles. It's It's really fun, actually. It's, like, you get, like, this sort of um psychic connection with cats because they have such subtle ways of expressing their mood whereas dogs are like super like captain obvious about all their emotions oh yeah (laughs) absolutely i think it's kind of really special when a cat chooses you and it's like yeah i like you like yes i've succeeded at everything in life yeah except when our cat chose us we like were were cursed to a life of screaming and body slamming of doors, but she was like, she was unique. <laughs> All right. Oh my goodness. This drawing, I'm going to like run through the process a little bit. Cause I haven't really been talking about it that much. Um, yeah. Sorry guys. Siri started this. Yeah. She changed the subject. Um, <laughs> All right. So For those who came in later as well, it might be good to do like a little bit of a run through. Um, So it started with this sort of simple sketch, right? Like really loose, not too perfect or precise, just basic shapes. And then the sketch on top is a little bit more detailed. And then I sort of, and the next step added some color to that. So just some really soft colors and changed the line color to more of a red like a brownish reddish color and multiplied that on top and added like some very subtle shading and basically like I merged that all into one layer so this like everything merged together and then I just paint on top of it really um and that's how I'm getting to where I am now and I made some color adjustments as well so you can see it went like a little bit redder and now I'm just slowly painting like you know just a bit of extra dimension here and there like you know, detailing certain areas a bit more. And if I was going to turn this into like a full on digital painting, I would, you know, uh, spend a lot of time detailing it and adding lighting and stuff. I'll add some quick lighting later as well, like a simple trick that I often do to give it some more dimension. But yeah, you can see as well, like something that I always want to emphasize, you know, when I go from like the rough sketch version to the painted version is that you can see like her facial features are shifting a little bit or changing um the eyes the position of the eyes changed a bit because I liquefied it a little bit I kind of like I try not to stick to the sketch too tightly you know because as I'm rendering it 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 will change it will like uh, my my perspective might change or like as I'm adding more detail I might find that like something that worked here just doesn't work as well here so that's how I kind of approach that like step by step. And the thing is like when I was drawing my first sketch, 
like this version. I, d I didn't know that I would be going for this as the end result. It just kind of happens along the way by just taking it step by step. Um, and I'm gonna like quickly get the time lapse in here. Oop. Let's see if we can get anything out of that. Like you can kind of see here, like how, how the face changes, like kind of slowly bit by bit, layer by layer. Like I also added like these small pupils here and then got rid of them later because I didn't like them. And that's sort of how I do it. Like I just go with the flow and kind of step by step. Um, and that's what I recommend to people who are like trying to figure out their way in, in the software as well. It's like just draw something and see where it goes. And if you're sensing that you're not getting anywhere, start over, make something else, you know, like don't overthink it too much. Just take it easy and you'll, you'll figure something out. Everyone has that work in progress graveyard. Yeah. Oh gosh. I have a lot of them. And another, okay. So something that I like to do, I'm going to change the background color to like a slightly darker than white, just something kind of neutral. Let's see like this. So another really simple trick to add like a little bit of dimension. This is something that I do in almost all of my live demonstrations like is add like a bit of like a bright white highlight along the edge of the character. So right now she's, I mean, I like the fact that the colors are all very close together in value, but if you want to like quickly add some dimension, you could like explore. So on a separate layer, I've got, I've got a layer on top um, and I'm just going to like, Oh, I've got like all the wrong brushes here. Give me a second. Um, so I've got my, my brush and like, what if there was like a bright light over here on the side, um, hitting her nose that, that already adds like a lot of three dimensionality. And I could further explore that, like add it on the side of the face. Um, I always like adding stuff like this on a separate layer because then I can always like get rid of it or easily erase and change it. And then kind of see like, okay, how would it work if it was on the other side as well? This is something that I do a lot in my concept art as well. Like just little, like just a little bit of um, like um, an extra highlight can, can make it seem more three dimensional. And that sometimes is what a drawing could use to make it feel more real. And I do a lot of concept art for stuff that later gets translated into 3D. Uh, and, and so stuff like this is, is really helpful for imagining it, oh, imagining it in a 3D space. Um, and it's really simple, you know, it's just a question of adding some, some chunky white or very bright colored lighting along the side. Um, and the main thing, like when I do this in, in my workshops, like people who haven't drawn these kind of highlights often, they they tend to overdo it a little bit and add it like all along the side, like along the side of every shape. But I, if you're going to do this, just be selective about it. Like have, have it hit some areas, but not everything because you want to draw, you want to just add a little bit of extra dimension, but not like have it feel overwhelming in a way. So you want to just catch some shapes, but not everything like less is more in this case. Um, and since it's on a separate layer, I can just, um, duplicate that. So I, now I have two and the top one, I can, uh, like blur it a little bit. And that gives it like a lighting, like a soft lighting effect. So this is like a simple trick that I like to apply to a lot of my art just to give it like that extra three dimensional feel and a little bit of extra contrast as well. If it's sort of like feeling, um, if the contrast is sort of lacking. And it, because it's on a separate layer, I can also like really easily change the color of it. Like let's say I'm gonna lock the transparency and just give it like a beigey color. Um, and then set it to screen so you can like play around in general. I do recommend if you're using like white and black. So if you want to have like a really 
a bright color or a really dark color, try to um, like use a substitute for that. So not exactly black or white, but just like a little bit, like maybe a little bit of a bright yellow or like a bright blue or something instead, because that gives it just that extra little bit of color depth. Like I feel like going for like a bright, blue color is is working better than going straight for white somehow using black and white like can flatten the color scheme really easily and another thing that i just like was so excited to find out about is like all of those cool effects that procreate has now like chromatic yeah, aberration filters. Yeah, the oh, filters, yeah. and you can, like, paint them on. Like, when I first discovered this, I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> Where have you been all my life? It's really fun, this stuff. Yeah, I remember when our dev team were kind of telling us about the filters for the first time. And the filters, I think, were a really cool part for us, for our 2020, when um you know everyone had just come out of lockdown and the pandemic's happening the panna cotta um and our dev team were kind of like yeah we're just gonna do something fun and they all sat in a room together and just started creating yeah and all of those filters were what came out of that massive creating session and i remember when we were kind of like the whole of procreate the whole of savage interactive sat down and they were going to show us these filters and then they were like and you can paint them in with the pencil and we're all like whoa yeah that is whoa, just so cool i mean it i've was... been yeah. yeah it's also like so um like i don't know spot on for how artists work because i used to like make um uh like i used to duplicate my layer add an effect to the duplicated layer and then put a mask mm. on it and paint on the mask so that certain parts of it showed. And this is basically oh, like that, <laughs> but it's just skipping the mask part. Cause I remember when I first heard about a mask, my brain was like, no, that sounds too complicated. I don't know. Nope. That does and sound complicated. It is hard to explain as well. Like masks are actually in essence quite simple, but mm. it is like annoying to explain. And if you never use them in your process, it, it just feels, it's like a, a little bit too complicated. And I always have a hard time explaining it. So this is just, this is just exactly what artists have been doing, but like just easy and intuitive. And that's what made it so cool. I was really excited when that came out. Anyway, I think she's as done as she's gonna get. I might spend more time on it, but for now, this is it. Mm. Beautiful. Okay. Has anyone got any last minute questions? I know there's going to be like a tiny delay with the stream here before people start hitting the comments. There's been some people drawing along while they're watching. That's lovely. Oh, that's so fun. I love that. You guys should upload it to Instagram and tag Loish. Yes, I want to see it. It's been so low. It's been so chill in the chat. It's it's been really nice. Yeah, it has. Nice little crew that's been watching today. Yeah. Listening to our stories about pet <laughs> body language and the the most tragic Black Mirror episode. Oh goodness. <laughs> Sorry, I told you about that. It's almost like one of those things. <laughs> Where it's like you'd you'd be better off not knowing about that idea. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm gonna constantly wonder if Siri is a tiny <laughs> part of my soul from now on. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> oh, that's why she so accurately is able to give me the perfect blend of early two thousands pop punk music whenever I ask. <laughs> oh goodness! Early two thousands pop punk music. <laughs> It's very specific I love that music, stuff. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you know what's weird? Like when the 2000s were happening, I was like, this is the worst, objectively the worst era of all time. <laughs> and now like I'm just noticing that like people are starting to like it again. 
and I'm starting to like oh, it again. It's too. come back round. Yeah, it's coming it's back. But like around. usually like trends would take twenty years to come back and now they take like three Yeah, years. right. It's like, hey, oh. this trend is back. Young people are just discovering it and it's like a thing that happened yesterday. Like, oh. <laughs> yeah, no. We've been there already. Yeah. It's like this is <laughs> this is recent history, my friends. <laughs> oh my goodness. Okay, I think everyone is just being chill. Lots of people spreading some love in the chat. <laughs> it got serious for a sec there. <laughs> 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 love a good pun. Uh, cool. All right, we might wrap it up there then, I guess. Uh, someone's Spotify 2020 rap was all 2000 songs. I feel that. I feel that. Yeah. All did right. you did you do that thing where like a bot analyzed your music taste? I didn't. I was too scared to do that, honestly, because it, for that exact reason, it'd probably just tell me like the same three songs over and over again. <laughs> yeah. Like it's just not. I'm I'm very lucky that um, my partner Adam has a very wide and varied range of music. So I do get to listen to more than just the same three bands over and over, guys. I promise. It's just that my personal Spotify is stuck on that loop. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We might end it here for the night or night for me, <laughs> morning or like midday for all the old guys. Yes. Um, thank you so much for joining us, everyone. It's been fantastic to have you in the chat big thank you to Lois for joining us as well it's been fantastic to watch your process Lois thank you for being on our stream yeah it was so much fun and thanks everyone who came out and uh yeah I see a comment about somebody getting roasted about the amount of Taylor Swift I listened to one <laughs> Taylor Swift song one and the bot went after me for it I am still upset about oh that. my goodness okay. I'm Personally sorry, I'm diverting once again. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, this was a really great stream uh, and um, and the, I really love the chill vibes. And thanks everybody who uh, came out to say hi because like I love seeing your comments come by. And also uh, uh, thank you to people who, who are going to tune in later and see this at a different point because I know that the time zone wasn't ideal for other areas of the world. So hello to all the future watchers as well. <laughs> <laughs> all right just a couple of things to wrap up everyone um if you want to follow lois you can find her on instagram at lois vb you can also find her on patreon at lois if you'd like to support her there um yeah and of course you can find us at procreate across all social media platforms thanks for joining in and we'll see you next month bye bye, -bye.